When Tammy and I first got married, my wife's, my wife's dad was an alcoholic, and let's be honest, I enjoyed alcohol a little too much in college, so she said, you want to date me, no booze. So we didn't drink. We didn't drink, and we went on a vacation. Oh, man, we went on our first vacation, and, and if you're young and poor, that, there's no better vacation than that first one. It's just awesome, because you don't know what it is. It's just like, wow, this is what people do. <laughs> and we took an evening cruise on a boat in Hawaii, and I don't know that there's any more beautiful place on earth in Hawaii, a sunset out on the boat, but we were on this boat, and we had our kids, and they were serving alcohol. And if you've been to Hawaii, alcohol always looks fun when they serve it in Hawaii. It's beautiful colors. It's fantastic, right? It just looks like, wow. And my kids were like, Dad, we want that. But in our house, we didn't drink. And I told my daughter, I said, I said honey, you can't have that. There's alcohol in there. And she goes, there's drugs in there? <laughs> She's all, do they know they're drinking drugs? And my daughter, before I could even stop her, walked right up to this woman, enjoying some beautiful Hawaiian drink on a sunset with her husband. She goes, do you know you're doing drugs? You shouldn't do that. And I was like, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Did you hear the words? You shouldn't do that. That's what ones do. They should on themselves, others, and God. Stop shooting on yourself. Stop it. Some of you right now, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but listen to me. It was at that moment I realized, here's what legalism does. Legalism says the problem is alcohol. The Bible says the problem is you. You see, legalism says the problem is out there. If we just can clean up this messy earth, this messy place, then I'll have peace in here. Jesus says the mess isn't out there. The mess is in here. This fits me, I think. It feels like it's encompassing me and it's very like rigid, yeah? Uh, I gotta sit up straight. As the reformer, it's oftentimes hard to find the beauty because I wanna go and think about all the things that I need to work on. I'm super organized, I'm on top of stuff. If I say I'm gonna be there at 3.50, I'm there at 3.45, uh, but oftentimes I fall short of my own standard. And when I fall short of those or others fall short of those, my initial reaction is just to critique, to fix. In this series, I wanna continue to learn more about myself, learn about my wife's style, those around me, I think it's super important. It's just an easy way for me to relate to others. I only practiced 40 times. Hey guys, welcome to a series called You, and today we're gonna talk about style number one, the reformer. So many people are like, I'm not a number. You're right, last week Jesus called you dirt. Your name is Joe Dirt, Trampled Dirt, Rocky Dirt, Thorny Dirt. The very first human being ever made by God. His name is dirt. The Bible says from dirt you came and to dirt you will return. So I don't think numbers should be that offensive, amen? I think we say, okay, God. And today we're gonna talk about the number one. But so many people have such a hard time being boxed in. And let me tell you something, the Enneagram doesn't box you in, it's gonna set you free. It's gonna allow you to be the person God's called you to be, knows you can be sees your future if you just trust him and begin to work on some flaws. But so many people say, you know what, Pastor Matt? I, I just don't understand the number thing. Well, let me give you an example that I think will help. If you and I were gonna have dinner and I invited you over to my house, I'm gonna give you a set of numbers. Now those numbers don't tell you who I am, but they do help you find me. Some of you are married to a total stranger and you love your spouse, but you don't know your spouse. And when you take the assessment and you look at these numbers, you're gonna go, oh, okay, I can find you. I can understand you. And so many of the personality, just consequences and struggles and strife that we have, they're not personal, they're personality. And we gotta say, hey, I'm gonna love you for how God made you. I'm gonna help you become all that God has called you to be. So they're gonna help you find yourself, listen to this, and the people that you love. That kid that you're disconnected from, you're like, Lord, where did that child come from? Lord, I asked for this child, but now I need you to take them. That child, that child, you may have a new sense of appreciation for that person. And today we're gonna to talk about the reformer. And I think it's so important. So many people say, well, I don't understand the fascination with numbers. God loves numbers so much, he has a book called Numbers. 
And today we're going to talk about the story of the prodigal son. Now, now, so many of you guys, you know this story and it breaks my heart that we call this the story of the prodigal son. Because it's not a story about a prodigal son. It's a story of a father who has two sons. And let me just tell you something if you're a one today. You're the most important in our lives, but you're often the most forgotten. And just like in the story of the prodigal son, we pay all the attention to the moron, praise God, right? He came back, he's alive. Yeah, but he was an idiot. And we forget the son that was doing what he was supposed to do. But unfortunately, listen to me, if you have just the slightest bit of one in you, I don't want you to miss the party that Jesus is throwing in heaven because your self-righteousness will keep you from his righteousness. And the older brother doesn't come to the party and he gives in to his anger instead of to the loving grace that Jesus Christ has given to all of us. And to so many people, man, that have problems with the Enneagrams, unfortunately, listen to me, I love you, you're a one and you're straining at a net while you're swallowing a camel, and you're so focused on where everybody else is getting it wrong, you're failing to see where you're missing getting it right. So let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we pray in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus that you would do your work, the work that only you can do. God, all the Enneagram is, is going to show us is where you need to cut. And then God, we're gonna invite you to cut in that area and to bring healing in that area in Jesus' name. Help us today, Father, to learn from this story that your son, Jesus Christ, taught. We pray this in your name, and we ask your Holy Spirit to fill this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So let's take a look at this famous story that many of us has misunderstood our entire lives. To illustrate the point further, Jesus is talking about your value. Your value. He compares you to a lost sheep. He compares you to a lost coin. Nowadays, he would talk about a lost phone, Amen. The other day, I lost my phone seconds after using it. How is that even possible? I'm like, I was just using it. Where is it? And unfortunately, my phone is black. Anybody phone black? Why are they not neon? I can't find it anywhere. But you all know that when you're missing something that has value, that's all you think about. And so Jesus, to illustrate this point further, he talks about two lost sons. One who thinks he's found and one who knows he's lost. So the man had two sons. Listen to me, reformers. The oldest son and the younger son, right? So the younger son's in number two. The older son, wait for it, he's firstborn. He's number one. I want to share, I want you to, to know this and, and to know this about you. He says, Father, I want the share of your estate now before you die. See, praise God, if you're poor, your kids will never ask for your money because you don't, you don't have any. You, you, you want half the Twinkie now or later? See, poor people, God has blessed you and you don't even know it. It's why Jesus said, blessed are the poor. Because, you know, the only thing they fight over is, you know, a seat on the couch. That's it. But his father agreed. Listen to that. His father agreed. Listen to me, church. Sometimes God gives us what we ask for. Be careful what you ask for. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his, his younger son packed all his belongings and headed for college. No, wait, that's my story. Okay, back to this story. And he moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money on wild living. Well, right, that's what you do when you're young and stupid. Some of you are like, I, don't, I can't give any money to God, but I can spend $8.95 on a, on a latte. <laughs> Listen to me. You need to learn to spend things on money on things that have value. And then he finally came to his senses. We live in a world today with no sense. Stop calling it common sense. We need to name it uncommon sense. And he said to himself, at home, amen, at home, even the hired servants have enough food to eat. But here I'm dying. I'm dying of hunger. Some of you are starving today and God's saying, let me feed you. But in your pride, in your arrogance, you, re you refuse to turn to him. I'm here dying of hunger. It's amazing what can happen in your life if you will humble yourself and say, God, I'm ready to come home. Some of you are like, nope, I'm still stupid. I'm gonna make it on my own. And God's going to answer that prayer. And you're going to keep running with Camp Dumb. That's what you're going to keep doing. <laughs> Listen to what he says. He says, here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against you, both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. That's repentance. Yes. Some of you negotiate with God. That is not repentance. Repentance is God whatever. 
So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, listen to me, you wanna know who God is? You wanna know what God is like? Here it is, Jesus knows his dad. He says, here's what my father is like. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion, not judgment and not rage. He didn't say, you wasted all my money. You see, a loving father makes money to bless his sons. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. God is ready to run to you if you will run to him today. And he embraced him. And he kissed him. Think about all the issues we have with our dads. Your father in heaven kisses his sons. He loves his sons. He's not afraid of affection. My grandfather went home to be with the Lord this year and my grandfather changed many things about the trajectory of my life. He gave his life to Christ, the first person in his family to do so. I love my grandpa, but when I would love him and kiss him, boy, he was uncomfortable. <laughs> I love you, grandpa, I give him a kiss. <laughs> he just never knew what to do with that because he never knew love from his father. You wanna change the trajectory of your family, men? Learn the love of your father who is in heaven. You may not have had a dad on earth, but you have one in heaven. Listen to this. He said, his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to him, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and kill the calf. We've all been fattening, man. And all the Chick-fil-A cows are like, don't repent, don't repent. <laughs> that, fat, that fat calf, he been living good, huh? Whoa. who's home? We must celebrate with a feast. Listen to this, for this son of mine was dead. And that's where you are today, friend, without God. You are dead in your sins, but he has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. Yes, it's all great, right? No. Every party has a pooper. That's why we invited you ones. We love you but you don't like to party. You like to referee. <laughs> Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working and when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. This is not how we live in a Baptist home. That's what he said, amen. <laughs> we gotta get Satan out of here. He asked one of his servants, what's going on? He said, your brother is back. Your father has killed the fattened calf. And we're celebrating because of his safe return. And the older brother said, yes! No, he was angry. Some of you are so broken by sin, you can't even party with Jesus. The older brother was angry and he wouldn't go in. I'm not going to that Sandals church, they're happy. <laughs> they need to be miserable like us. His father came out, remember, because he loves both his boys. Not just the moron, but he loves the responsible one. And he begged him, Jesus is begging you, please come back. Come in, come in, come on, just come to the party. And the son says, all these years, dad, I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. You see, ones do what they're supposed to do. And all that time, you never gave me even one goat. He got the fat calf, I can't even have a goat for the feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours, isn't it interesting, he's not his brother, this son of yours, comes back squandering your money on prostitutes. I always think that's interesting. How did he know he, what he did with his money? Where were you, son number one? <laughs> you celebrate by killing the, the fattened calf. Listen to me, his father said to him, look dear son, you have always stayed by me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but he's now found. He's now found. Listen to me, reformers, I love you. And you were a gift to this church and there's no sandals without you. You reflect God's goodness. You're the son that stays. You're the son that's there. You're the son that never leaves. You're the son that does what they're supposed to do. You reflect God's goodness. Your motivation, God bless you, is being good and right. My motivation was, what can I get away with? 
When I go bowling, I need the rails to keep me in the lane, amen? Ones, you are the rails. You're writing down the score, I missed, I missed a pin. I'm like, I hit a pin, I hit a pin. You wanna be good and right. And just know this, not everybody thinks like you do. Have you been on the freeway? Not everybody drives like you do. Not everybody knows to signal before you turn. Some people have never seen that. They don't know what that is. Oh my gosh, I got a new car. He has a computer, I think it's an unhealthy one. <laughs> it is constantly telling me, keep your eyes on the road, make sure you signal, touch the steering wheel. It's like, my gosh, drives me crazy. But listen to me, here's your core need. Here's what drives you. Here's, here's why you need the Enneagram to uncover what's underneath. Here's your core need. It's to be perfect. Well, good luck with that because that'll drive you crazy. You're not perfect. The world's not perfect. Only Jesus was perfect. And this world killed him. But guess what you avoid in your need for perfection? You avoid criticism. It's hard for you. Jesus says, why do you notice the speck in your friend's eye but you fail to see the log in your own? Here's why ones, because you beat yourself up so badly you have to look at the sins of others so that you can have a temporary reprieve from your own criticism. Your focus is flaws. What's wrong? What's wrong? So many of you, if there's a mistake, you quoted the wrong verse, thank you. Thank you. Should have been a comma there, should have been a period there. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for pointing out my flaws. But that's all you see in the world. Listen to me, when you're focused on flaws, do you ever see beauty? If all you see in life is what's wrong, when do you get to see what's right? I was talking with an unhealthy one in our church who lost his mind because his daughter got a B. I'm like, B stands for believer <laughs> and C for Christian, amen? <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you what A stands for. <laughs> you're, you're, you're sinners. C's get degrees, baby. Come on. But you know what? His wife was sitting there with tears in her face and, 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 and she said, you made your daughter feel so defeated. You see, oh, an unhealthy one can only see the B. He missed the five A's. I don't have any tattoos, but if I ever had a report card with five A's and one B, that's what would be on my chest. <laughs> Fifth grade, right here. I peaked. Here's your core sin and listen to me. Here's why ones struggle so deeply coming to the party because we talk about every sin in scripture but this one, anger. What was the son's response? How did he respond? My, my, my dumb brother, he's alive, he's back. We killed the fattened cow. I wanted that for me, but hey, we're all gonna have the barbecue. He was angry. He's angry. James says this, that human anger does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Anger's like milk. It's good for a little bit. You leave it out too long and it's nasty. It's nasty. And let me tell you something, some of you need to learn to smell what's rotten in your life and it's anger. What's the core fear of the one? Being flawed. And you are. Here's what's so sad. We don't know what happened to number one in our story. We know the obvious seven, amen. He came back, he partied, he's broke. Money never meant that much anyways. You know, the next story was, son, don't sell that ring. Don't sell those sandals and don't sell that robe. 
We don't, we don't know what happened to the one in our story. And sadly for many of us, this is our story. But there's another one in the Bible that we do know how he was changed and God dramatically altered his life. His name is Saul, but he's most widely known as Paul. You see, when ones are unhealthy, even though you, your core motivation is what's good, what's right, what's true, the problem with that is guess who decides what's good, what's right, what's true? You do, and you find yourself in an argument with the father over why you're celebrating this dead son. You see, reformers, when unhealthy, when you don't feel safe, when you don't feel secure, when you don't feel loved, reformers can become blinded by anger. In Acts chapter nine, verse one, it says, but Saul still breathing threats of murder against the disciples of the Lord. He's attacking them. He's killing them. He's destroying them. Here's the thing about anger that I found. Anger is the easiest emotion to express, but it's the most difficult to understand. Why are you angry? I'm not angry! <laughs> I've actually said these words before. You wanna see anger? <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're getting a view of it right now. <laughs> anger can destroy you. Anger can ruin you. I watched a video this week of a police officer who came into work and he was arrested by his own friends because of what he had done to his wife. A man who swore an oath to protect and serve hurt the one he's supposed to protect the most. And his own friends cut his own uniform off him and cuffed him and took him away. That's what anger does. Anger takes a beautiful, wonderful person. And before you know it, if you're not careful, you're killing the movement of Jesus. When unhealthy, ones are terrified of their own sins and struggles. Right, outward focus distracts us from inner fear. If I can just fix you, if I can just fix you, then I don't, we don't, I don't have to worry about me. And we're constantly looking at everyone else. You, oftentimes, you're the referee. You're making sure everyone else is doing it right. When Tammy and I first got married, my wife's, my wife's dad was an alcoholic, and let's be honest, I enjoyed alcohol a little too much in college, so she said, you wanna date me, no booze. So we didn't drink. We didn't drink and we went on a vacation. Oh man, we went on our first vacation and, and if you're young and poor, that, there's no better vacation than that first one. It's just awesome. Because you don't know what it is. It's just like, wow, this is what people do. <laughs> and we took an evening cruise on a boat in Hawaii. And I don't know that there's any more beautiful place on earth than Hawaii, a sunset out on the boat. But we were on this boat and we had our kids and they were serving alcohol. And if you've been to Hawaii, alcohol always looks fun when they serve it in Hawaii. It's beautiful colors, it's fantastic, right? It just looks like, wow. And my kids were like, dad, we want that. But in our house, we didn't drink. And I told my daughter, I said, I said, honey, you can't have that, there's alcohol in there. And she goes, there's drugs in there? <laughs> She's all, do they know they're drinking drugs? And my daughter, before I could even stop her, walked right up to this woman, enjoying some beautiful Hawaiian drink on a sunset with her husband. She goes, do you know you're doing drugs? You shouldn't do that. <laughs> I was like, I'm so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Did you hear the words? You shouldn't do that. That's what ones do. They should on themselves, others, and God. Stop shooting on yourself. Stop it. Some of you right now, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but listen to me. It was at that moment I realized, here's what legalism does. Legalism says the problem is alcohol. The Bible says the problem is you. You see, legalism says the problem's out there. If we just can clean up this messy earth, this messy place, then I'll have peace in here. Jesus says the mess isn't out there. 
the mess is in here. Next, reformers, if you're unhealthy, remember, you feel unsafe, you feel unloved, you don't feel secure, you can be driven by your own sense of justice. Some of you don't know your, your Bibles as well as maybe you should, but the greatest preacher in, in, in the early church, his name is Stephen. And some of you have never heard of him because he was killed after delivering maybe the greatest sermon ever preached. And he was killed by a guy named Saul. And he's still breathing threats of murder against the disciples of the Lord. Listen to this, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found anyone belonging to the way, and some of you don't know this, we weren't called Christians yet. You see, Paul thought we were a cult. And he thought he was doing something that was good, right, and true. And so he was going to stamp out this movement of Satan that unfortunately happened to be the movement of God. And this is what breaks my heart. So many people who are opposed to the Enneagram, they say that's satanic, that's evil. Somebody emailed me this week and they said, the Enneagram has the number nine, which is evil. And I said, well, how many fruits of the spirit are there? Last time I checked, and I'm right, there's nine. There's nine. Listen to me. The Enneagram can't save your soul, but it will show you where your soul needs to be saved. And so here's the Apostle Paul. He's making sure everybody's okay. He's making sure everybody's doing it right and he's killing the movement of God. Men or women, ladies, he didn't care who you were, he arrested you. That he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Listen to me, things can be legal and still be wrong. Yeah, put down the joint, listen to what I just said. It's legal, bro. But it's not helping, bro. You'll hear that in a second. <laughs> Listen to me, nothing that numbs you ever changes you. You can't get better by numbing your problems. You only get better by facing them. Reformers, when they, they feel insecure, unloved, unsafe, can be consumed with a critical spirit. Listen to me, church, the Holy Spirit is not a critical spirit. And many people think it is. And some of you are so focused on what's wrong, you're failing to see what's right. My wife, man, I love her, man. She's God's blessing to me. She's like 98, 99 score on the one. I'm in the low 20s. You know, she'll change outfits 10 times. Do I look good? Do I look beautiful? Yes, for the 10,000th billion time, you look amazing and beautiful. Like, I just assume I look good. I just, you know, I just, you know, yeah. Right? I mean, guys, we're deceived, man. But I'm like, you're so beautiful. She's like, really? I'm like, yeah. Exhausting, but beautiful beautiful and we were in small group one time and my wife was you know like women do sometimes I just feel ugly and someone in our group high eight goes are you crazy I was like no comment but here's the thing ones oftentimes not only are you blinded by your anger but you're blinded to your beauty and you can't see how beautiful you are you see, the, the son, all he could see was that I missed out on the party. The dad says, but it's all yours anyways. It's all yours. And you're missing out on my love for you. You're missing out on my concern for you. We had to party today because your brother was dead, but he's alive. He was lost, but he's found. Listen to me, God doesn't want you to stay unhealthy. God wants you to move into health. 
And if you have high one and you look at your assessment and you see those negative scores, it's going to be like the arrows of Satan himself piercing your soul. It's okay. It's some place to start. That's all it is. And it says, you know what? We got some work to do here. When healthy, here's the beauty about you. When you feel safe, when you feel secure, when you feel loved, listen to me, reformers, reformers can get a vision of Jesus. You're blinded by your anger, you, you get a vision of Jesus. You have an encounter with grace. You have an encounter with God's one and only son. And listen to me, if you're one and you're critical of yourself and you say, I'm never gonna be good enough, I'm never gonna get this right. When God wanted to change the world, he picked an unhealthy one. Where were the other guys? We don't even know. God's in heaven. Who's this guy, Saul? The Holy Spirit's like, he's motivated. And God's like, I know, he's killing us. <laughs> Let's recruit him on our team. <laughs> Once, how powerful would it be if you changed teams today? Instead of criticizing churches, why not join one? Why not be a part of one? And you're like, well, that church has problems. That's why there's room for you. <laughs> when I started Channels Church, we were gonna be perfect. And then like three months in, I'm like, who, who started this thing? <laughs> Everybody wants to be an Acts 2 church, right? Kumbaya, we're Acts 6 church. <laughs> all the sin, racism, all those issues. It's because we got people in here. We're Acts 6, buddy. We got widows starving, it's terrible. That's the church, that's real life. Acts two is the honeymoon, I love you, you love me, we're in Hawaii. <laughs> Acts six is, we gotta pay bills. You gotta go to work. What, wait, what, yeah, you. Acts nine, three through six. As he was approaching Damascus, on this mission, he's going to kill Christians. He's going to arrest men and women. A light from heaven suddenly shone down around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, listen to me ones, you need to hear from Jesus. And Saul asked, listen to me, a religious person, a devout person, a person who loves God, devoted his life to God, listen to this. This is what happens when you're unhealthy. He says, who are you? Wait a minute, this is the God you're serving and some of you are so busy making sure everything's right, you don't realize how wrong your relationship with God has gone. You couldn't, you wouldn't know God's voice if he spoke to you today. You say, well, I'm busy being religious. That's why Jesus died to save you from that, to bring you back to him. Who are you? And the voice replied, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. You see, when you're unhealthy, you're terrified of your own sins and your own struggles. When you're healthy as a one, you can become honest and open about your sins and struggles. You know what I do? I carry a bag of sorries on my back. You need one, I got one. Pastor Matt, you sinned, I know. I know. My wife's a one, hi, hi, one. She struggles. Sometimes I try to help her, just say it. Just, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm an expert at apologizing. I do it all the time. I, I'm good at it. If you want to learn how to apologize, ask me. That's the first Hebrew word I learned, slecha. It means I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 1 Timothy 1.15. The apostle Paul goes from a self-righteous punisher of Christians to an open confessor. Listen to what he says. He goes from literally straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel to 1 Timothy 1.15. He says, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them all. That's a healthy one. That's a healthy one. Jesus didn't just die for them, he died for you. That's what a healthy one looks like. You're never gonna be perfect. That's why we worship the perfect one. And let me just challenge you today. It's okay to be imperfect. 
it's not okay to try to pretend to be perfect. Jesus Christ's favorite cuss word was hypocrite. We translate that word today, actor. We celebrate actors. Oh my gosh, you were so fake, you convinced me. Here's an award. We celebrate hypocrites in our culture. Jesus Christ condemned them. He said, don't be a faker. Learn to become real with yourself. Learn to become real with others and learn to become real with me, Jesus says. You see, reformers, you can, you can become full of compassion and love for people despite their flaws. The apostle Paul was overwhelmed with the flaws of others. Some of you are raising two years like, you got dirty again. Yep, and they will tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. Or you could just love your two-year-old as the filthy little monster they are. <laughs> the same way God loves you for the filthy little monster you are. God's like, that's my monster. Here's what you do as a one. You just have to learn to make an allowance for people's faults. Do you notice that Paul uses the word faults, not sins? Sometimes people just make mistakes. They're not sinning against you. They're not evil. You know what's so wrong with our world politically right now? The other side's always evil. Or they're just mistaken. Or you're mistaken. Like we all make mistakes. I mean, it cracks me up, right? We're constantly pointing out the flaws of people who oppose us. And we're rooting for our side rather than rooting for God's side. Make an allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. You're like, nope, nope. Man, listen to what he says. And remember, the Lord forgave you. So you must pray about forgiving up. No, no, you don't have to pray about it. You must forgive others. Cracks me up when my kids were little, you know, and if you have multiple kids, if you have one kid, you're cheating. It's not really, you don't, like, you know who did it. You know who messed it up. When you have multiple kids, man, you have to turn into a doctor, an attorney, an investigative reporter, right? You got to find all these things out. But when our kids would fight when they were little, it was hilarious. Hilarious, right? It's always the other person's fault. They started it. They were in my space first. They hit me first. You know, it's always all these reasons why I can sin, Dad. My favorite fight between my daughters was over their memory verse, be kind one to another, <laughs> which turned into a wrestling match. It's like, I don't think you guys understand what the verse means. But it would crack me up because my wife, you know, she's just, she's just so intense on our kids loving each other and getting along, right? And that's her hope is as, as we age and they get older, they would love one another. So she would make them make it right. Now apologize. And then the other person had to say, I forgive you. You've never seen a more contorted, twisted face in your life. It was easier to apologize than it was to say these words. I forgive you. I was like, oh, that's good. Now let's try to say it like we mean it. I forgive you. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? It's hard because forgiveness is moral perfection. It's what God can do that we can't do. He forgives us. Isn't that incredible? And so many of you, you run around telling the world that you've been forgiven by Jesus for all your sins and you can't forgive one sin that's been done to you. The Apostle Paul learned to give grace. Isn't it interesting that God used a one to become the champion of grace? The champion of grace. Listen to me if you're a one. You can be a champion of grace but you have to kill that critical spirit that's inside you. And there's only one way to do that. And it's what had to happen to Paul. You gotta become filled by the Holy Spirit. That's what changed him. He had an encounter with Jesus. And the result of that encounter was a loss of sight. He was blind. And listen to me, everybody who's listening to this, you might invite a friend, you might be sitting at home watching this with your spouse, and they might hear a bunch of noise and get nothing. And listen to me very carefully. When Jesus spoke to Paul, he's the only one who understood. 
Everybody else thought they heard something, felt something, thought they saw something. Paul heard Jesus. So don't wait to change till everybody in your life hears Jesus. If you hear Jesus, you change. And he was blind. So God appeared to a guy by the name of Ananias and he said, he said, Saul has heard from me and he is blind and I want you to go to his house and I want you to pray over him. Listen to me once. Here's what Ananias said. Lord, he's scary. He's scary. If you haven't taken the assessment yet and you want to know if you're a one, tonight at the dinner table, just ask your family, did you guys feel like what Pastor Matt, he was talking about me at all? And if everybody at the table goes like this? (laughs) No, Dad, no, no, I, uh, no, uh, no, Mom, you're, 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 you're a picture of grace. <laughs> like if your kids flinch, you're scary. This is you. Anais is like, this guy kills people. He kills people for their imperfections and, and, and where he thinks they're wrong. He arrests his husbands and wives and he abandons children in their homes. I'm not gonna go pray for this guy. And listen to what the Lord says to Ananias. I will teach Paul what it means to suffer for my name's sake. I hope it doesn't take that for God to get your attention. So Ananias, he departed and he entered the house and laying hands on him. Listen to me once. God will use the hands of brothers and sisters in this church who are terrified of you and frightened by you to change you. God uses imperfect people to bring about his perfection in you. And so many ones, it's just me and God, just me and Jesus. But Jesus has not called you to be alone. He's called you to be with him and his people. And I pray for you ones that there's an Ananias in this church that will lay their hands on you. And will say, even though you're scary and you're self-righteous, I know God's gonna use you to change this church and make Sandals a better church and to help Sandals accomplish its mission. He laid his hands on him and he said, Brother Saul. He didn't say, now Saul, tell me your testimony. He just assumed the Holy Spirit was right. Why don't you start doing that? The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The only way to get rid of a critical spirit is to be full of the Holy Spirit of God. And the sevens are like, yes, yes. I've been waiting for this. And the ones are like, oh no, oh no, this is where they cut the chicken's head off. I knew it was coming. No, no, listen to me. You don't have to be weird to worship in the spirit. Matter of fact, if you read 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, don't be weird. That's what he says. That's a Matt Brown summary. Stop being weird. There's enough weirdos in the world, amen? We don't need one more for Jesus. But here's what you need. You need the Holy Spirit of God to wash over you and to change you. If you identify with the one or you're like, well, maybe that's me. And that's why the assessment's so important because it shows all of who you are. That's why I disagree with so much of the Enneagram teaching out there. You're not a one or a two or a three. You're a mixture of multiple styles that God has placed in you for you to discover you. So if this is you, would you just bow your head and close your eyes and lift up your hands? And I'm gonna pray for you right now. Risen Jesus, would you speak to this beloved son this beloved daughter, this number one. They've worked so hard, they've done it right. They've not partied or wasted their life. But Lord, they're consumed with anger. They're full of a critical spirit and all they see is flaws. Spirit of the living God, wash these sins away. Remove this critical spirit from us and fill us with your spirit. Lord, change us like you changed Saul to Paul. Make this healing dramatic and powerful today. We pray this in Jesus' holy name, amen.